Hello, Ender Sword here again, this time with a Bronze League game. We are going to be looking at uh, is T G G or something like that, Insta G or whatever, G. And uh, his Zurich play, he posted this replay up on the TeamLiquid.net strategy forums and was basically looking for why did he lose this game. He felt that he got a early lead in the game and was able to kind of keep on par with the Protoss player but ultimately does end up losing, so we're going to go over this game and figure out what happened and how to assess what's going on. Uh, the opponent for today in the bottom left-hand corner here is going to be Replicant Owl, um, which is kind of an interesting name. Um, I guess that's one use of the Replicant thing coming out in Heart of the Swarm. You can replicate an owl and fly around the map or whatever. He's obviously, uh, just from the placement of that pylon, going to be going for a Forge Fast Expand, as is fairly popular on this map, given that you have a ramp and it's uh, fairly easy for the Protoss to defend. Anyway, the top three things that we're going to be looking at during this game are number one, as is almost always true in these bronze games, we're just going to be looking at macro um, overall and just keeping our eye on when things aren't being produced and when production cycles are being missed, uh, things like that. And for the Zerg, obviously, injections that aren't uh, being done. Macro, obviously, being one of the most important things for anyone at really any level. And uh, it's just something that you want to start early and get mastering. The second thing we're going to look at is always improving your economy and improving your technology. You should always kind of be in some form of trajectory upwards so that each attack you do after every few minutes in the game, you're always better off than you were a little before, and you want to always be improving what you're doing. And there's times here that the Zerg player kind of stagnates on the same level of technology for too long. The third thing that we're going to look at is the idea of assessing damage. There's a lot of times where you see the complaint of, hey, I broke in there, I did all this damage, I killed all your workers, I killed this building, whatever and um, they think they're much farther ahead than they actually are and so what are we going to be looking at to actually assess where we are in the game and what something really cost you uh, to launch that effort versus where your opponent actually is now. So uh, we can see here that obviously there is a Forge Fast Expand uh, going on and he is aware of that at this point. He was able to see that the forge was going down. However, he pulled the uh, drone away and didn't actually continue to scout this area. You want to try and make sure that you continue to scout or take a look at what's going on for as long as you really can. Uh, even if you do pull out and just come back in, that's fine. Uh, but you can see in this case, he put the forge down, but because the drone left, there was actually not a need to put the cannon down or actually complete the wall off. He's going for the gateway. He put the nexus down right after. So this is actually a fairly undefended forge fast expand right now. And it's only now after the nexus is completely complete that the photon cannon is going down. He's fairly confident that he can get away with that because he saw the timing of the spawning pool and because the Zerg player wasn't there to check it out. If he had stuck around in the area, it just forces him to change the order that some of these things happen, and um, he'd be less likely to try and kind of take advantage or be a little extra greedy as he was in this case. He'd have to actually defend himself, fearing that uh, maybe there are some zerglings that are come and, uh, and take your stuff out. Uh, overall here, we look at the... Uh, the tech path going on, he is going for the, the speedlings, going for roaches, a fairly commonish uh, thing to be doing there, and getting his uh, queens out. This queen doesn't immediately start in the inject. He is missing a lot of the injects on the hatchery up here, so a lot more production could be going on here. We're also just leaving a lot of larvae on the ground that aren't being used right now. So you do, especially in the early game, not really want to be pooling these up for anything. You want to be using the larva as it comes, improving your economy, and really getting things going there. He could be a lot higher on his supply uh, at this point in time if he was a little more proactive in getting those things uh, off the ground and used up. 
when you do have three or more at a hatchery, they also don't naturally pop out, so you're kind of permanently missing some of the larva that would be naturally producing itself by keeping three or more there. When you've got zero, one, or two, then the hatchery will just automatically make them. When you've got three, it's only going to make additional ones when you do the injects, and of course he has uh, missed quite a few of those injects uh, so far in this game. So he's going out for the somewhat early, uh, not really early, but uh, going out for just an initial push here to kind of test the strength of uh, what's actually here. You can see that this isn't a very well defended uh, for its fast expand. It's not actually walled off or anything. There's only a few units out. We still got the uh, warp gate upgrade going, so we can't really rally a lot in to, um, to defend right now. He does chrono that, trying to get it, realizing that he is in a bit of trouble here. Uh, the cannon's going to go down. Now, there I'll pause for a second and talk about target priority during this whole fight. And we'll just look at what the Zerg player is doing in terms of switching targets fairly constantly, not necessarily prioritizing the best targets. And he ends up with leaving a lot of things almost dead, but not really dead, and if you're a little more focused with your attack, um, it almost doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, more than that you're committed. So if you decide to start attacking something, then finish that thing. Don't just kind of blindly move from one thing to another, changing your mind all the time. If you decide that I'm going to go for this nexus, get the nexus. If you decide I'm going to go for the probes, get the probes. Don't start with one, switch to another, that sort of thing. Here, uh, given that we saw the chrono boost coming down on the cybernetics core, it tells you very loudly, in addition to the fact that this is still a gateway, that the warp gate research wasn't actually done when this attack started. So the first bit of target priority that should have occurred to him was instead of targeting down the actual photon cannon, given that he had enough force to take things out, it would have been more useful to just take this pylon out immediately and stop the production of the warp gate. If he actually was able to stop the warp gate from finishing, we'll just rewind to see if that would have been possible, and I think it was in this case. Here the warp gate has about, I'd say, yeah, like 20 -ish seconds left when he really kind of makes the breakthrough. We see the chrono going down there. If he was able to target this pylon as opposed to the uh, photon cannon, he may have been able to prevent that from coming out. He obviously didn't know the exact timing of that, but that's the type of thing you should be looking for to say, it's really important I actually get this uh, to stop because that's what's going to allow him to create these warp gates and ultimately defend himself. Here the Nexus, as I said, ends up doing taking a lot of damage. These roaches are kind of just waiting there. They're not, this one's firing on the Nexus, these ones are holding position. Um, he's running around from target to target, leaves this four to 28 health left. There's really no reason that couldn't have been finished off. Uh, he pulls back, pulls back in, pulls back, pulls back in, and then decides, so I do want to attack these stalkers. If he had just decided to do that immediately, um, as opposed to actually dancing back and forth. He could have both got the forge, he could have killed all four stalkers with the uh, slings that he had there, and done it before the next round of warp ins was available, uh, which unfortunately he didn't do. So this second round came in and stopped that attack and shut it down. So at this point though, the Zerg does feel like he did a lot of damage. He killed basically all the probes in this line, and uh, He's going to feel pretty good about what he's done. I broke the front, and so obviously he's thinking, well, I'm ahead. But if we look up here at the unit count, yeah, you killed a lot of probes here, but at the expense of not making any of your own drones back at home. So he's only got 21 drones back at home because all the larva that was available, first of all, a lot of it was missed by not doing uh, injects during that uh, during that fight, and there's still just now he was missing that inject, and uh, and the fact that a lot of those didn't become drones. So the larva was actually spent on giving you that attack. So if you cost yourself 10 or 15 drones 
to launch the attack, and then you killed 10 or 15 drones on this side, or probes on this side, well, then you're really even. You're not ahead. And in the meantime, the Protoss still has the base that he wanted to expand to. You're on two base versus two base with a Protoss player. It's not the type of place that you want to be. Uh, he has the technology that he was looking to do. He's got five gates up and running now. He kept uh, hold of the forge, was able to just replace photon cannons to defend himself. So there's no real uh, sustainable losses there other than the actual loss of the probes and the loss of about six or seven units uh, in that. So there's no real super damage being done there. Uh, the second attack kind of comes in, and again, we're not decisive at all on what's going to be attacked. He goes to get a surround on the photon cannon, realizes that, well, I can't stay there. The forces are coming in, kind of traps himself in this space, goes for probe, stops going for probe, now attacks the simulator. You've got half the army attacking the enemy army while this, you're just not getting a lot done. That was a complete donation of all those forces, and there wasn't really any damage that's been done. This front is completely attacked, these guys are fine, don't really think any probes were lost in that, just kind of stopped some mining time um, from these probes in the main. So it's, again, not a point that he gained any advantage from this. And if you look at the overall supply, 46 to 68, the Zerg is now really behind, but I'm under the impression that he thinks that he's fairly ahead. But when you look, these two bases are reasonably saturated. We're still on two base versus two base. The Zerg player should definitely be uh, expanding as opposed to just making this a macro hash. Now, he's got enough money that uh, it's certainly valid to do both, expand and throw down a macro hatch if he wanted to do so. But again, we still got larva being unused on the ground. The main wasn't actually saturated. We're not taking either of these gases right here. The Zerg economy is actually quite uh, weak. It's not that great. He's just now getting up to a reasonable uh, drone number, although he's still a couple drones short just for two bases, and we're not even using the gas. This one's only got two on it. So that's going to be, you would think, limiting a lot of his tech options, while at the same time the macro is just slipping so badly uh, that gas is just skyrocketed. It's true for both players, but the Protoss at least uh, has a bigger army and force out on the map at this point. Whereas the Zerg, limiting itself to just these hatcheries, doesn't even have any way to spend this money. The tech is actually stagnating. Uh, we're going for plus one, plus one in these Evo chambers, but there's no jump up to another type of unit. We now know this is mostly a gateway army here. Uh, it's safe to assume you're going to see blink stalkers at some point. You've got the zealots, enough of them to kind of shut down a lot of this mass ling type uh, thing. We're not keeping a good eye on what's happening in the Protoss base. Robo facility there, Stargate there, and obviously there's the blink starting. Anything could be happening in here. We don't really know what's uh, what's going on, the Zerg player doesn't have any sense of that. If he was going for just something fairly standard, like I'm going to get a couple of Colossus out off two base, and now he's expanding to three bases, um, then these lings are just absolutely useless. There's not enough roaches here to really provide the meat to this army. So it's not a great composition, and it's just a stagnating comp uh, composition. The text that finally does end up coming up here is the Spire, which again is somewhat of an interesting choice. The Mutas are a little better now. Uh, not that they actually got better, but they're starting to be used a lot more against Protoss um, for harassment and things of that nature. They are quite good that just a couple seconds in the mineral line can take out everything. But given that we know that the stalker count is quite high, uh, very likely that he's going to get blank along with this. And this late into the game, it maybe doesn't make the most sense to be transitioning into Mutas um, when you know that that force can't actually directly engage what the uh, opponent already has out on the map. Uh, the links come in, they do a bit of damage against stalkers when in small numbers. The problem is once you get a larger pack, 
it takes a longer time for all the lanes to surround everything. They only get limited surface area on all these stalkers, and they don't do the damage they do if there was only, say, four stalkers there and 20 lanes. They can just surround a lot better, get into the cracks a lot better. When you've got a big ball like that, they're just not going to do it. It takes a while for this to be completed. Look at these lanes trying to get in position. Again, we see some target switching problems here, and we've got a lot of these stalkers that are almost dead, but due to the shuffling around of lanes, it's just not a very good attack. It, it's the type of thing that does kind of counter what he's got here, but it just doesn't do very well by its own, and at certain number levels it does, uh, does fail. We do get the blink up there, this uh, defensive line with the spine crawlers, Again, a bit too static. Um, creep wasn't really spreading around anywhere. That's always a huge part of their game. Um, if some of this attacking had been done with these lings on creep, as opposed to Oki Oka, uh, then it would have been a lot better. So lings could have gotten to a position a lot quicker. Uh, the roaches would move in and close a lot quicker. Uh, things of that nature do make a fairly large difference, not to mention the fact that he would be able to completely see the uh, all the protoss movement. Now, uh, see there, again, initially thought he had killed, say, 40 probes in the initial attack. Really got about 10 of them. Uh, maybe 10, 12 probes that uh, actually went on. We'll see during the course of the entire game. Uh, it's this again. So workers killed. Um, obviously these ones were just killed there at the end. But uh, yeah, 32 probes over the course of the game. And is that, no, that's, uh, sorry, that's the blue player that did it. So 19 probes were killed in the entire game. That's not great. Um, the initial attack that did kill 10, 10 or 12 of them, that's good. Yeah, it's certainly progress and it's a good opening attack, but you've got to remember that it cost you the fact that you weren't making drones and you were instead making units and basically ended up with the two players not only on even footing but with the Protoss completely ahead because while he lost all those probes, the Zerg then loses his whole army doing it and the Protoss has his base up, he's got his tech up, he's got his army going. So he's not actually held off, uh, held off on anything and he's not actually behind in that scenario. So that's something that people should be aware of. Just because you feel that you accomplished what you wanted to with an attack doesn't necessarily mean it was a good attack. Maybe what you accomplished wasn't actually big enough to pay for what you lost on it either in actual physical losses, what you lost in opportunity cost of not getting the drones out, or what you lost in time and teching up and things of that nature. So that stuff is very important as well, and that's ultimately what uh, did dominate the game here, as well as obviously this final point that Bizerg never did get uh, third base. He waited too long to follow up on this initial attack. If he had kept streaming in a lot more stuff, um, then it probably could have worked as well once he had cleared the probes out uh, and just forced the Protoss player to then try and support all these gateways off just one base. Probably would have been harder, but ultimately didn't expand, didn't really follow up the initial attack, didn't move off the original tech level that he was at, only got a couple upgrades extra, and then the foray into the Spire was both really late and very much the wrong direction for what he wanted to do, uh, knowing that there were stalkers out, likely with Blink by the end, and even Phoenix on the map. So it just wasn't the direction that uh, that he should be going in, and then does get caught off guard with the, uh, the Blink up, but by then the game really was already over and uh, very much in the Protoss hands. Anyway, so I hope that was helpful in pointing out what did go wrong in this game, and uh, thanks for watching, everyone.